it, it could work. I don't know if it, if it gets um, if the bandwidth um, for the network uh, causes problems. We might it might be good to turn off your camera. But yeah, go ahead. Let's see. Let's see how we do. I, I don't know if people need to see me. I think they probably know what I look like. You know. <laughs> so uh, uh, let me just set a, uh, an alarm so I don't go on for an hour. It was a risk. I want to take some questions. How long have we got? Half an hour, something like that. Half an hour is your talk, but uh, as I said, let's no go way. quickly then. Here we go. <laughs> Ten years of LibreOffice, or is it twenty, or is it thirty-five? Who can say? You know, I don't know. So uh, if you look at the Wikipedia uh, picture here, which is very, very beautiful, obviously, um, we have you know twenty years, but forty-five years since Marco Borges releases the first version. Was it thirty-five? 85 to 2020. It seems like a long time, anyway. I think this was written in Pascal. Um, but anyway, the, the key thing was, uh, you know, Sun buying Star Division and uh, Marco open sourcing it in 2000. So as part of that, of course, we dropped uh, the email that used to be part of Star Office and the desktop uh, thing. There was a sort of Windows 95 style desktop thing. And this is really a, a collaboration. Nat Friedman, uh, Miguel both went to see Sun um, and, and talked about the Linux desktop. And uh, you know, and, and so we went with GNOME as a desktop, Evolution as an email client, and OpenOffice as an office suite. And kind of uh, each company could then refocus people on, on those bits, as, as I understand. Um, so so OpenOffice was launched. And in the, in the launch party, I, I guess, or at least the announcement party, which I was at, which is San Jose, I think Sun, Sun was uh, funding some, some wonderful thing. Um, let me actually just turn off my Telegram announcements. Wait a second. Uh, uh, I thought that's the, Uwe, so the problem with uh, full screen sharing is you get all these wonderful uh, pop ups yes, from, uh, of course, uh, uh, from every kind like of uh, collaborator. Uh, they, they are paid by customers. But of course, uh, uh, but we have a, a larger end user base uh, than just collaborator customers. And for instance, as I said, uh, uh, improving Impress uh, doesn't seem to be uh, the objective of uh, uh, many paying customers of Collabora. And there might be a reason, uh, um, because uh, uh, presentations are uh, uh, probably a um, niche uh, application. And uh, so there, there is a lower request. Uh, while I think uh, I might have been a little uh, over enthusiastic uh, uh, closing windows there. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, let's uh, and, try uh, uh, uh -huh. Maybe. Are you still uh, with me? Can anyone hear? We could uh, either uh, 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 what can I do? present uh, a plan. So, uh, of the initial uh, launch party, we met with Miss Response for the first time after lots of uh, positive companies and constructive willing discussions and some of the collab nets was going to be paid to manage uh, and create uh, the most beautiful community in the world. Uh, and to be fair, this was a tough gig, uh, you know, paid for by uh, a company, building the community at, you know, sort of in, in between them. But it, I don't think it was helped by Lewis being a social scientist with no FOSS experience really at all. And uh, so he taught Star Division how FOSS worked with lots of inflated so rhetoric and I think upset quite a lot of them. Um, he was described by one interviewer as the Linus Torvalds of open, open Office, on, which is extraordinary because with no development experience, I mean, uh, I think, yeah, I don't know, it was, uh, it was just a little bit, the, bit uh, odd. And of course, the governance of Open Office was deeply uh, gerrymandered on uh, his it's the fact that There was no, we have um, never, uh, no real uh, <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's hard to describe how broken it was. Um, and he also had a strategic focus. We, we, you know, he really we focused on development the, or attracting developers. Way, but strategy, but uh, totally a couple of developers. So, you know, I remember from reassuring about it, but no one in the community uh, thinks it's IBM not uh, releasing its open office code changes as anti-social. Uh, well, you didn't speak for me. I thought that was deeply uh, anti-social. Talk is cheap. Uh, show me the code. Uh, I think that's a good way of uh, looking at life. Uh, and so, you know, another great top tip would be to get a developer happens. to write and even test your uh, build instructions so that actually the community project could actually build it. But let's try. Um, here's some work that we did. Uh, David Ostrovsky from Civ and myself built the thing on, on the right, which tries to show you how LibreOffice works, let, let, you know, help people understand. But the thing on the left was built clearly to try and persuade people that they couldn't possibly understand it. And so much of the OpenOffice uh, you know, documentation was like, just don't bother. Um, I don't know if that was strategic or accidental, but um, who knows. And the development process was crazy. 
uh, people would fundamentally change APIs way down in the stack and email people to say, hey, uh, you know, I just reordered the parameters and uh, please update all of your code. And sometimes you could catch that with a compile error and sometimes you couldn't, like, you know, like this guy. Hey, it just copies the other way now. And, and they would mail out, please update all your code and move on to breaking their next, you know, the, the, the next day. Yeah, if we don't um, so have users, the build tree was in a permanent then, state uh, of brokenness. We will not have a community um, over you know, release so. engineering would from time to time branch the tree, try to make it build, try to okay. chase engineers to fix things, merge all that, and after about a week, they would produce a binary snapshot, um, which probably yes, base their work on or continue working with, um, because the, the code took a long time to build and whatever. And actually, yes, if you look at our credits, you'll see these committers are still at the top of the commit and, count. Uh, uh, maybe quite long. I don't see any, or or maybe no, or any reason why we should be they're, they're really very near the top uh, because they merged the so, so many uh, commits. So my experience with OpenOffice was we can become a build. stronger in terms of uh, community even as well. Guys, I, don't like, know, I mean, a little bit of experience in software engineering. We, and, we uh, have 10 years of history you know, behind our shoulders, and we have been rather... I was just full of optimism rather, when we worked on you know, unstable GNOME you know, stacks, where you know, actually on, things on did break, but if you updated and got a... I think it's time, it's time to review the model. Uh, but if you updated it, it's time uh, having got a build, that you can get a better build. Start, uh, but, uh, it took more weeks to get something working. Many so I had to create this uh, build thing, view, including the fact that contained a public set of patches uh, and fixes necessary to turn a snapshot release features, but into something that we could actually they may ship not and have, uh, distribute. Because of course, immediately adopted the, by the, all the Linux distributions. The good, the, Partly because 24 hours into a build, if it fails suddenly, you have a real problem. I think sometimes we forget, you know. How it's well developed by our future vendors and these in the world that make things, is, uh, you know, really quick maybe to build. Maybe not the best solution. It was uh, pretty hellish there. Um, so, so, how did all this come about? Well, I, I just like to go through a little bit of a, a timeline here. So, so Marco Borries was okay. awesome, obviously, created Star Division. Open sourced it ultimately, he sold it to Sun and left the building. Um, he turned it over to Jörg Heilig, he was, he was a great guy. Uh, right. and eventually, Google sold him. And he went on to create yeah, Gmail, yeah. which you may have heard of. Um, Thank you for Bemba then everyone. was in charge of it, come, come out of the QA department, and, uh, uh, and did, you know, uh, see you a as soon job as possible. Really. Um, around this time, uh, I guess but Zinian was, was shipping, and all the distributions were shipping uh, stuff, and we were actually contributing to um, uh, OpenOffice at the time. The others, uh, and we did a whole load of pretty stuff, making the UX nicer, the right. icons in, alpha blending for your icons, so it's not sort of single bit marks and individually nailed pixels, all, all sorts of good stuff. And uh, we didn't behave terribly well, partly because uh, we weren't contributing all of it back. We were contributing some things, but not everything. Partly because at the same time, we were in talks by some to buy us. They are very much in the form, hey, why didn't you contribute everything back and then we'll buy you? And our talks were very much in the form, why didn't you just buy us and then you'll have it all? Um, these things happen, I guess. But in the end, we were acquired by Novell, not Sun and uh, started to ship all that stuff upstream. Um, sometime later, the, the CISL license was dropped. So s the Sun Industry Standard Source license let people um, uh, take the code and not contribute back. I guess it was like a BSD-style license, uh, as long as you didn't break the file format and interoperability. So it was an interesting approach. I, uh, you know, there's nothing particularly wrong with it, but it was a dual license, uh, LGPL v2 and CISL. Um, and with the CLA, so some continue to own the rights for all of that. But essentially, IBM misbehaved. They didn't contribute their, their code back. Uh, they, they used the sizzle to not do that, uh, which was just kind of bad. On the other hand, there was a CLA there, and uh, you know, it was, it was pretty nasty um, having to get your code in for lots of reasons. Um, so, Stone Edition, uh, 2005, this is a, a quote from a mail in, uh, that I wrote at the time. Uh, giving almost everything away has almost destroyed Sun's Starvation's revenue stream. At this point, they had to have a whole lot of budget cuts, um, and they threatened Novell with a change in the license to the GPL. So we were shipping, of course, uh, OpenOffice in, in our uh, distribution. Uh, by then, Novell had bought Zimian, as were many other people. And we were pretty against this change to the GPL because it would threaten all, all the plug-in ecosystem. It would, would put us to, to a disadvantage against Microsoft Office and so on and so on. And they, I guess they smelled money. At the end, we said, look, it's bad for the, the product, but what can we do? We, we, uh, we're not going to uh, you know, pay you for a, a proprietary license or, or some such oddness. We don't think it's a good idea. 
So StellarVision then cut a whole chunk of stuff. Um, but there were some positives. So, so in 2005, um, Intel's open source group, which was in the ascendancy, uh, sent us two people, which is great. I trained them uh, here in my home, still friendly with them. Um, and these guys, of course, were, were interested in the, in the compliments thing. You know, they, they wanted their, their CPUs to run better with uh, Libre OpenOffice at the time. Sorry, I keep saying LibreOffice. That's good. Um, so they did a whole lot of performance work. They tried to improve I/O and so on. They, they really struggled to get much of that in. But actually, some of their work, you know, avoiding atomic reference counting on single CPU systems and so on, had a big um, impact at the time for Intel. But um, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, much of this predates uh, Git or SVN or anything that logged really who did what. Um, and in 2006, actually, one of those, those people that uh, OpenOffice or Sun had just hired, Zahid so Bora, um, actually went from Sun to Google and encouraged Google to hire people. So that was great. So uh, we had Kai Backman um, was hired and he, he did some you know, like training with me, a great guy. And uh, he started to do some just extraordinary work. Uh, we recommended him to do just look at the build system and get the build system, improve the build system, because everyone got stuck in there and they were low hanging on um, And so he worked on PCS, he, he helped with this version migration, and, and he could build, he could do a no op build in a minute, which, which took half an hour for, for you know, some, some build system. So he did some amazing things. Um, I, of course, there's the, the Bell Microsoft announcement, I guess, our open XML filters are still based on um, based on that work and some tough times there, although Microsoft hired around 10 people effectively to work on uh, OpenOffice. So there's some positive things there. Um, the problem was that there was a massive process for the other time. Um, so we had uh, five teams, there was a horrible original control system, QA people made it extremely difficult to get things in. The release no, was dire, feature base, uh, slipping. Um, and lots of this stuff really, I mean, it felt like treacle um, in any community discussion, doing anything. And, and a lot of the process was designed to exclude developers. So the people actually suffering this stuff weren't involved in the great strategic discussion around you know, what should happen and so on. And, and as, well, I don't know if it's a result of that, but the Intel left in, in 2006. Um, one year in, quite quite being there, um, and, and, and it's not that he didn't try. He moved to Hamburg with his family. He had face-to-face -face meetings with people. He threw chairs and swore that he was lying and it couldn't be done and it was absolutely awful. And just the spaces there was was amazing. He was urging me to fork, and eventually he he left too and, and moved inside Google. Um, it was too distressing to uh, to to work at uh, Open Office or with with Open Office. But of course, many of us carried on anyway. Um, so in 2007, IBM uh, started to uh, do this Open Office uh, Foundation course. They tried to um, kickstart something there. Um, we had a meeting actually in Boston, um, and Novell, my, myself, were, were there helping pull the people together and try and skewer their plans to to drive, uh, you know, uh, or to, to push Sun into a corner because you know Sun was doing a lot of the work and they were contributing a lot of the code. And it seemed entirely sensible uh, that they should, you know, be, be leading this thing, and that IBM should be contributing. In particular, that IBM should, you know, contribute code back to, you know, the common pool, at least publish it in a meaningful way. Unfortunately, uh, the net effect of all of this was that IBM got a proprietary OEM license from Sun. Um, it constrained them in all sorts of ways they couldn't share, and they also announced, seemingly in a connected way. Uh, Sun Solaris being sh shipped on IBM uh, servers, and IBM putting money into uh, driving Sun Solaris at the time against uh, Linux, including you know Novell, SUSE, Linux, and Red Hat. And so we saw you know our investment and our support uh, in, in Open Office of Sun used effectively to compete against us in the marketplace. It was you know, <laughs> and the hopes that we had of an open foundation or project, you know. Uh, uh, and a neutral solution where everyone can work together uh, with Dash. In a particularly irritating way. So at this point, we were preparing for the inevitable. Uh, we were doing all sorts of trademark searches, branding, bootstrap, fresh office, pure office, office unbound, maybe some of these you know, are cognitively similar. And we started producing Windows builds uh, of, of LibreOffice. Um, and we started pointing at the, this contributor license agreement, this asymmetric license that, that some required and contributing back under the terms that Sun gave to other people. So uh, things got a little more, more tense there. And yeah, 
was uh, it's a different form of IP, of course, of code, of copyright ownership, um, and using that to to give you know sort of sell sell exceptions or something. I think the episode I've called it um, in a way that harms other you know contributors. But there we are. It was still uh, pretty bad. And having signed this thing with IBM, there was still no code. We didn't actually get anything out of it. Around this time, the OpenOffice brand, which was owned by a thing called Team, I think Team OpenOffice EV, and which had some quite good people in the, in the uh, very opaque governance structure there. So uh, Cornell, I think, was there. And I recall him coming and telling me that they'd just given the brand to Sun. Um, they, they, they were bounced into voting to transfer the OpenOffice brand to Sun. And at the time, I wrote, yes, it looks as if a fairly benign non-profit that owned the OpenOffice trademark has just transferred it to Sun. Apparently, the intent is to clobber people into not using, effectively, our, our version of uh, OpenOffice, uh, which was which was pretty uh, pretty unfortunate. Of course, kind of doomed too in some ways, and as much that no Linux distribution would use, you know, the vanilla OpenOffice at the time, it was simply unusable. Um, so we then had the prospect of not just having the code ownership used against us, but also the trademark uh, used in the marketplace against us. And so, so then there was a lengthy trademark guideline discussion and so on, and, and at the end of it all, actually, uh, Sun came up with something that, that sort of worked, and I, I, I forget if we, we rebranded away from the open office, uh, the Vellum, perhaps elsewhere. But it never used the uh, never used the brand effectively, actually, to build its business, which is a shame, because it could have done some really good things there. Um, so IBM, uh, on, the, on the meantime, and um, you, know, you might wonder why we didn't go to Apache with IBM. Um, you know, they... they they were promoting this foundation in 2005. There was a press release in 2007. Here we go. IBM make, will be making initial code contributions to developing, blah, 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 will be, blah, blah, blah. And they talked of, you know, a dedicated team of 35 programmers. It all sounded really good. We should definitely do something nice for IBM. A year later, uh, at the LibreOffice conference, or the OpenOffice conference, you know, the execs were there saying, well, we've got a bad scorecard. You know, like, we haven't done so well yet, but we will be contributing. Uh, two years later, you know, we have this press release. IBM donates Lotus Symphony source code to the Apache Open Office project. Uh, amazingly, at this point, there was still no code released and contributed. Um, <laughs> absolutely amazing. Um, only in 2012-05 did we actually get usable source code arriving at Apache that could be, could be merged at, at Christian. 58 months after this had been promised in a, in a press release. So, so what do I take from this? This is. You need to be really careful about people who say they're going to invest things, um, and you should, you know, change everything and, and you know, do do stuff, diversify your community by including IBM quickly, um, because they're going to do all this good stuff um, without actually having a credible plan and seeing what's actually going to happen. Um, talk is cheap, um, and, and it's not like this is, um, you know, this is the result of a thousand man supposedly professional strategy team at IBM. You know, they have a central strategy team. I mean, if we'd spent one of these guys doing some coding, we would have got, in those like, five years, uh, more code than we got out of this than the end, I suppose. Having said that, it's worth noting that there are a whole load of other really unhelpful non-contributors to OpenOffice, and indeed LibreOffice, um, that, that just take and don't give back. And that's a, a pattern that we live with uh, even today. So anyway, here's the humorous bit. Uh, before the conference, I, I, went, I went to a UK conference and Hey, all these people um, talking, talking about stuff, holding up these things. So anyway, I, I had to uh, take pictures of them. Um, so an IT team, incidentally, was, was wonderful in theory, you know, having a QA member, a UX member, a something member, a something, something else, a specification, sitting down and talking before you uh, changed anything. There's a picture of a spec, actually, on the previous slide here that you, you should really write before you change the user interface. Now, of course, anyone actually using the user interface would realize that, well, you know, a few paper cuts really help. And actually, well, it's still still the same today, actually. Um, yeah, held together with red tape, um, lots of bugs, not getting fixed at all. Um, uh, of course, the contributor license agreement really uh, stopped people getting involved, which is really uh, relatively sucky. You can see when Fedora dropped its. Um, now, of course, TDF, uh, you know, when we launched it, we had this no, no vendor dominance. No one can control more than 30% of the votes in any statutory body of TDF. That's, of course, a good thing. Um, although actually this is often around 10%, although the threshold is significantly lower, if, for example, the membership committee is it's around 10%. Um, but it, it probably turns out it would be more useful to focus on actual diversity and building an ecosystem that attracts many independent participants 
uh, than overly obsessing about this uh, particular detail, it seems to me. And um, yeah, and it's also in large part marketing. I mean, when, when we created LibreOffice, Sousa was by far the largest contributor. We had about 15 people on it against two Red Hatters and, well, luckily lots of volunteers. But uh, you know, we, we really needed to emphasize uh, that vendor neutrality uh, piece to make this not be seen as a Microsoft plot, um, which was uh, the, the problem at the time from a marketing perspective. Um, I think the frustration thing is something that I think will be familiar to many people, that, that, that you get a large organization and it becomes very static, and there are many obvious problems, and you think you can fix them, but there's nothing that you can do. There's always someone saying, no, can't be done, it's not possible, and you know, there you are. I think the frustration there is something that was epic uh, and long running. As you see, we lost Google and Intel and various people because of it, but yet, I don't want to give a perfectly negative picture. There were actually lots of really good people, and I think you know, uh, guys that I'd love to sit down and have a beer with still, who who are, you know, they were just helpful and encouraging and pleasant, and they saw the problems. I mean, it's not like it's not like these problems were unique to people outside the company. I think they were there inside the company too. You could talk to frustrated uh, people there, but it was it was really a sort of a cultural disaster. So, well, we launched. How did we launch? We planned all these people. Susan bought everyone a very nice meal and uh, walked and. Uh, you know, life, life was good. Um, but launching was kind of tough. You know, we got to the point where we're, you know, we got approval from everyone. Um, you know, and there's some quite deep management chains here, um, all of which are very supportive, amazingly so. Uh, quite a lot on the Red Hat side, uh, myself, I guess, on the SUSE side, and some of these people still involved. I mean, quite a lot of myself and Guy are actually still, you know, kind of involved in the free software, uh, free software world here. It's kind of good. I think Jan Bulldog is still an evangelist at Red Hat. But either way, and of course, Italo uh, Press Agency, but everyone started saying, well, after you, we'll do it if Google does, you know? Um, but of course, uh, we, we were up against other people trying to play divide and uh, conquer. So anyway, how can we unlock uh, a Google quote? Well, I, I mailed Chris and uh, Jeremy, an old friend of mine, and, uh, you know, he says, well, basically, uh, you have to, you know, these guys are outsourcing their due diligence. Uh, you're the press release king makers, so uh, we have all these people on board, if you do. So, you know, double rainbows and ponies mentioning it as being a good thing um, would be fantastic. And we waited. Well. <laughs> and luckily, seven days, or three, three days later, they, they came up trumps. So Google could leave very quickly. Here's the proof quote. Chris DeBain, our open source programs manager, the creation of document foundation is a great step forward. And this essentially unlocked all of the other quotes from people uh, and everyone else. With that, we got Sousa, we got Red Hat, and everything else fell into place uh, behind it. So uh, thank you to these people. They perhaps don't get any credit or recognition of, of their role in making it possible uh, to do a large launch here. And of course, you know, uh, Jeremy's stuck around and done lots of good things with ODF and Legal Summer Code and so on. Um, but Often we hear this story that the community, in inverted commas, and, and these days the word community is used to exclude the corporate ecosystem, and it's community against companies, um, that the community by itself went and created LibreOffice. Um, that was not my experience. Volunteers play a vital role. Christoph, for example, here, creating a logo. Um, amazing, amazing contributions. But without the ecosystem uh, and the companies behind it, you would just simply go on so, here we go. This is, is funny, man. I'm not sure I like it. Of course, this is a page of great examples of logos. Um, lots of other great people, uh, you know, Susa guys here, uh, open Susa guys to do now, are doing fantastic things, set up and so on. And they've been released. Fantastic. And we've got you know, the FSF, uh, G at the Vell, Yana at Red Hat, uh, Mark Shuttleworth at Ubuntu. Simon Phipps supporting us, obviously, been there, you know, from the beginning and seeing this, and various, various other people. And there you are, and it doesn't, well, maybe it looks totally different now, as a flash, but that was our 3.0 three release beta. It, it uh, looks very familiar. Under the hood, of course, uh, we, we, we developed one thing, which was having phone calls uh, to reduce conflict. Uh, using email to resolve conflicts is a reliable way of making everything worse. Quote. Uh, anyone that's uh, interested in conflict resolution, really, and I think it, it's always take about sitting around tables. It's, it's very helpful as well, eating together, you know, understanding um, each other. Many large flask projects 
quite super made up. They, 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 it's just terrible internally. At least from the technical perspective, LibreOffice is possibly one of the smoothest and most pleasant and easiest to be involved with projects that I've seen. It's really, really beautiful. The engineering side. Now, the, the, the marketing board, community, strategy, something, something else stuff is, in my view, a total mess. But the engineering guys, they seem to work together, which is great. So various things happened here, of course, at the time we had to get Oracle and Sun involved, so we didn't. Um, tragic, you can see them, I guess, you can see my cursor drop out in this red, red chunk here. So the yellow to red is Sun's Oracle. Um, SUSE spun out half of its uh, Linux, uh, LibreOffice team. Um, and, you know, can I say they did that in an exemplary way. It was, it was, it was I think, the right business decision for SUSE, um, obviously. Um, but it was also just a brilliant, brilliant way to go about that. And Ralph and Gerald and Mills and, and the various people in the were, I think, simply outstanding. Uh, and, and of course, they continue to support uh, LibreOffice development even today, although at a you know, much, much reduced level. Um, which is yeah, much appreciated and perhaps used for like you know, some of the good things that they've been from it. But Rock on Sousa was, was, was a really uh, a good, good thing. And of course CIB, um, and so another thing that you see here is the people, you know, lots of the people go through this graph whilst companies come and go, which is really quite important. Um, and commit-wise, you know, you could see, see I guess, uh, Oracle uh, living there, um, but you know, we, we survived the, the large decline which you can see, I guess, beforehand, for, for you or so before we started, it was really not uh, as much activity. And then we did lots of good things. And I'm going to just skip through these, I don't have much time. Um, but I'll talk about technical leadership in a fashion based industry. So, so, one of the problems with the tech industry is that it is really fashion based. Um, you've got to be seen to be there, even if you're not. You know, you've got to have a finger in every uh, part. So, here we are, within, within a few months of uh, branching, uh, forking, whatever, uh, open office. Uh, we, we then had a browser based version. Fantastic. So Red Hat invested in a thing called GPK Broadway, it's just a fun hack week type project, I think. And uh, we, we picked it up at SUSE so that we could have a in browser office suite. And so that was demoed at our first Paris conference. Unfortunately, it took four years to actually find someone who was willing to fund turning that prototype into reality. In which time, practically nothing happened. So um, the code was there, the community was there, there was lots of, lots of good things you know, that were going on, for sure. But in terms of this, uh, there was just no investment. Um, and it's of course take, taken eight years to finally get uh, something that you know, does, uh, does that. Uh, what about collaborative editing? So collaborative editing, we again needed a figure in this, in this pie. So here we had a collaborator, Red Hat and Sousa. Um, building a prototype of the telepathy tubes of calc shared editing calc picked because we thought it would be the easiest uh, piece of the puzzle to uh, attack. So there you go. There we are in 2012. Um, this, of course, is still not fully formed. Svanta is still enthusiastically trying to sell the concept to investors left and right, and uh, we're not getting any. Of course, there is collaborative editing uh, built into Collabor Online, although that happens in a different way. Like this was a multi multiple synchronized. I can have a better time uh, view. Another thing that we did really early was an Android version. So uh, you know, Google started with code and SUSE uh, filled out this you know, uh, flag on uh, the mobile mobile thing. Here you can see one of the please screenshots 2012 is done of, of the work that I, I did here. Um, of course, it was difficult for SUSE to be funding random Android developments because, hey, they're Linux, you know, Linux come. Um, and this was not really, you know, it was far away from anything that made business sense for them. Um, so so we, we created this thing, um, it, it sort of worked, as you can see. Um, and it was really seven to eight years before we could actually get the investment to productize the proper Android uh, version, again, until the companies uh, came up to put that in. And actually Android is quite interesting, because, you know, if you look at it, the investment's a bit uh, jumpy. So Cloudon put a whole chunk of work in 2013 to fund of rendering for their own proprietary IOS app. Uh, Smooth and Calabra then funded the viewer, which is the shipping since 2014 based on, on Fennec. And in 2015, TDF funded this base framework for Android with basic editing, and we, Calabra, delivered on that, Ava delivered on that. Um, but then there was kind of a hope that the community would take it on and turn it into a beautiful application. And that didn't kind of work out. I mean, Christian did nobly battle the 
benchmarks here and trying to make it build and fix issues and things. Uti, yeah. Um, there, was, there was more hopefulness, collaborate, you know, we tried our bit. We, we put a whole load of uh, mentoring time and effort into Google Summer of Code initiatives. It probably was stagnant. Um, then, then, of course, the TDF marketing community arrived. There was a video, there was evangelism, there were calls for developers to come and help uh, do this. Was, can we get people to conferences and conferences to talk about it? But the punchline was, oh, and even more Google Summer of Code mentoring from Collabora. There's even a bit of work from um, the Turkish uh, be tapped, I think. Um, but the broadly, there was there was something that was so embarrassing at the end that it was, it was voted to remove it from the app store. Um, and this four-year gap, you know, we tried pretty much everything to get an Android version there out of it. But absent actual hard cash investment, which finally we got from Calabra and Adfinis, nothing happened. I think that's worth absorbing briefly. One of the questions about what is a foundation is, is, is interesting. So in 28th of September, uh, we announced that we will make a foundation after 10 years and all the public foundation. And, and this was great, but we hadn't actually agreed what a foundation was or where at that point. And so we spent the next 16 months discussing America, the UK, Germany, Italy. This may sound rather familiar in terms of looking for a jurisdiction. I actually have Luxembourg in there, probably. I, I imagine there are others, probably the Netherlands and so on. Um, and uh, the argument I basically revolved around, well, I thought the FSF, the Free Software Foundation, was a foundation, and I thought the GNOME Foundation was a foundation, and they're 501c3s in the USA. Um, or an association, but there were some people in our, our steering body who said, no, it's a Stiftung, and it is in Germany, or I quit. When I said foundation, I meant Stiftung and nothing else. You can't win all arguments. Um, so there you go. Um, with trepidation, it was then legally established in Germany, and there were lots of consequences to that. We wrote our statutes in stone, set them into concrete at considerable speed. And, and people who hold them up and say, this is the last word in, in everything, I think are deluding themselves. They've done well for 10 years, but I think it is worth not treating them as 100% possible, or believing that every consequence of them was well considered when they were written. Particularly that the world has changed since 2010, and, and so did we. So in 2010, the Linux desktop was the future. Uh, we expected 50 some Oracle developers and 10 IBM developers. We expected things, the nice things in life, to stay the same while we changed radically. And that actually didn't happen. Uh, in 2010, uh -huh, we expected, you know, that the 20 or 25 devs would be there building the future of the Linux desktop all the time, and that's what Linux distros were putting in. And we believe the economics is someone else's problem. It's not something we have to deal with. We had lots of good advice for sales people and marketing people, but we've never sold a marketer video. So, uh, 2012, it became more clear that just the latest desktop economics sucked. Uh, it was really hard to get to market. Um, there was aggressive competition. There were subsidized drivers for the Windows side. And there was the Ubuntu effect. The Ubuntu came and, and marketed a wonderful free everything. Everything is free, free and forever. It's all brilliant, and, and, and just come and get it from us and from our brand. And the consequence of the Ubuntu effect was gutting the desktop teams. First, Mandrake, Mandriba, uh, then uh, Sousa, and Red Hat, all were significantly depleted by the fact that you couldn't now sell a desktop, a Linux desktop anyway, anywhere, because the price point had been set at zero or negative by Canonical. And that's, that's economically problematic. I saw this effect happened to my team, my desktop team at SUSE, uh, amongst other things. Um, and, and of course the effect on not having sufficient investment in these things, but anyway, I, I won't labor the point. In the end, of course, 2012, SUSE spun out of its 15-person dev team and, and moved the other half elsewhere. 2017, Canonical retired their one developer um, for 80% you know, of the Linux desktop market for, for one developer to zero developers. Great shame, we lost Bjorn. Um, in 2018, Red Hat moved uh, several of its developers away. And so the world looks very different in terms of needing to have a clear cut economic understanding. Still, we met up, we had fun. Look at this, Fosdem, everywhere, Cakes, Hackfest, our first ever conference. It was cool. Look at it, La Cantine in Paris, you know, uh, doing, doing good things. The German Federal Ministry of Economics and Technology. Look at all these cool, cool kids there, um, you know, thrilled to be working together to uh, do something. That's something useful and meaningful. And, um, you know, continuing to this day, look at this, Italians, Albanians, 
uh, Almeria, wonderful. Um, and of course, Nuremberg, uh, sadly uh, virtual, but hopefully we're all still uh, loving it. I'm not going to list all the features. I, I, I had a, a thing to talk about features, but I think um, if we get all of the surroundings and the economics and the community and the fun around the project right, uh, the features come um, by themselves. So much look at other talks of mine to see accrediting. The marketing is really important. How we deal with our trademark, our brands, uh, you know, how we present ourselves is, is, is probably more important uh, than you know, the, the, the minor features that we add. Um, and we can see that from the open office comparison. And so if you come to my you know, talk on economics and, and why it's important we get those right. So what happens in the future? Well, we still need, you know, smart people to invest, to create, you know, the future of, of artificial document self-creation. You know, so you, you click the button and um, everything works nicely. Um, but, but my advice is, is pretty simple. Um, we need to focus the community on development. Everything we market, translate, document, tell people about, all of it flows from a strong technical focus, strong technical leadership. And we have to invest in development mentoring and education that goes alongside that and revitalize the fun of contributing to the code. Focusing on our primary production, not our tertiary strategy, unless that strategy drives more investment, more development, more, more good things. And it seems to me that the user experience, despite huge work, can still be improved easily. And it's just a great place to invest. It, you know, there are lots of things we need doing. But in terms of bringing people into the project, this has to be one of the easiest places to make an impact and see see what you're you know you're doing and get, get good things done. So there we go. The future of the office is bright. We're going to fix these things. We're going to work together. It's all going to be awesome. Um, but let's uh, let's try and get some conclusions. So. We did what we had to do to make the code base survive. I'm still convinced that we did the right thing, sad as it was to lose Oracle and Sun. Um, and thank you so much to all the many people I didn't name. There were lots of uh, extraordinary people doing things uh, across at the beginning, but also through the lifetime of both OpenOffice and LibreOffice. Um, economics bites. Be really careful of all incredible promises of future contribution that you use to inflict present harm to win a nebulous future. Because as has been seen, it is easy for people to promise and not deliver, even giant credible companies. Um, beware of the Ubuntu effect. Everything is free and can't get it from us without paying anyone. Beware of free lunches. Please understand that investment shapes the future. Of course, community contribution shapes it too. But if you look at the big gaps in our roadmap, our, 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 how, how we looked at our product uh, distribution, it seems pretty clear that you need people to put serious money in, and ideally you need to come back again and put more money in afterwards. That I think we're struggling with. Um, and really be careful how you use these collectively created assets. Codes, copyrights, trademarks, whatever it is, you have to be super careful or you create uh, uh, real problems for yourself. And even professional strategists, yeah, perhaps you are a strategist, even professional strategists that work in large teams and talk the talk can fall foul of development realities. Who is actually doing the work? Show me the code. And that concludes my talk. Thank you. Please do ask any questions. I think we have a bit of slack time, if, if there is some time for that. I'm very happy to answer. Uh, Michael, I wonder... Uh